Is it okay? Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalatu wassalamu ala ashraf al-mursalin Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Ayuhal ikhwa, ayatuhal akhawat, uhayikum bi tahiyyat al-Islam, tahiyyat al-Islam as-salam, fa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters, I'm very happy to be with you today. My name is Yanis Mahil. I'm a scholar in Islamic studies from France. And uh, before going into my uh, specific topic, I would like to share with you some views and insights. Of course, the context of my country, France, is different uh, from the context of US and Muslim in USA. But as Western Muslims, or Muslims living in the West, we have, of course, common challenges. And I think that it's important to create some links each other to share some experiences. Because like since I arrived here, I met many people from the area of DC or Baltimore involved in the community, and I learned so much. I learned so much, and I hope that you will also learn from me, inshallah. And especially <coughs> at the time of the rise of Islamophobia, Islamophobia became a global issue. And unfortunately, we saw what happened in New Zealand. Um, and that, that proves that Islamophobia is not only a matter of discrimination, it's also a matter of killing. Islamophobia is killing, not only discriminating people. And it's also our responsibility, as Islamophobia is a global pheno phenomena, to try to globalize the struggle against Islamophobia. And that is going through some collaboration between European Muslims and North American Muslims from US or Canada, and even with uh, the Muslim countries. And there is something which is very important. You know, when we are talking about the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, it's not only some stories that we are telling each other. The life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a source of teachings for us nowadays. It has to have an impact on our daily lives. And this is why I think that the topic of today is very important. The Prophet Muhammad and empowerment of youth. Because when we come back to the tradition and the life of the Prophet Muhammad we can find several stories, several texts which are dealing with contemporary issues when it comes to education, when it comes to empowerment, when it comes to youth, to leadership. And I'm going to share with you some of these issues. The first element is to say that the Prophet ﷺ had several ways to train and educate his community and his companions, especially young people. He had some tools related to formal education and other tools related to informal education. And the first step for the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, in order to set up a very uh, good community, a skillful community, it was to teach them the main principles of Islam. So it was a formal knowledge, religious knowledge, as well as spiritual knowledge and spirituality. The knowledge to know what are the principles and to follow the right path. It is said in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put some limits 
and we shouldn't close to those limits. We should follow the right path. And to know what is right and what is wrong, we should learn the principles of our religion. And the second element is the spiritual knowledge, like how to reinforce our relationship with God, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How to purify ourselves, our hurts, taskiyah to nafs. And in order to do this, the Prophet, during the first period of Islam in Mecca, set up an institution. The first Islamic school, if we can say it in this way. Darul Arqam. And in Darul Arqam, several young companions have been taught there. And after, when you, like, when you see some companions like uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, his brother Ja'far, radiallahu anhum, they became great leaders of our ummah. They achieved many, like, huge things, incredible things. And the starting point was education, empowerment, training. Darul Arqam is something that is very important for us in order to extract some contemporary teachings. Because uh, as a first step, the Prophet gave to his companions, in general, and especially young companions, the first tools to liberate themselves and to become, in order to become leaders and to face the challenges of the Ummah of Islam. And we know that the challenges were huge during this period of time. And you know, one, as a first example, I'm going to give you the example of uh, Usama ibn Zaid. You know that the Prophet appointed him, him as the head of the Muslim army to go to fight in Sham for a battle. And he was, according to different sources, about like 18 years old. He was very young. And the Prophet chose him to be the leader, the head of the Muslim army. So it was a huge and very important task and responsibility. And you know, even at this time, some elders, some older companions, criticized this choice of the Prophet Muhammad They said, come on, we are more equipped, skillful than this young man. How can you accept to follow him as our leader? And the Prophet challenged them. He told them, you criticized my choice when before I have appointed his father, Zaydin Haritha. And right now you are challenging my choice, my choice of his son. And the Prophet confirmed that he wanted to see Usama as the head of the Muslim army. And one of the teachings that we can take from this story is that the Prophet wanted, even if some people were more skillful among the elders, the Prophet wanted to train Usama through informal education. Because when you give to a young man like him this huge task, this huge responsibility, What's the consequence? You will reinforce his self-confidence. And self-confidence is something which is very important. And sometimes, nowadays, one point which is lacking in our community 
is uh, the lack of self-confidence because of all the elements that we have faced through our recent history, colonization, Islamophobia, a lot of Muslims have, have uh, a lack of self-confidence. And the Prophet ﷺ tried to give this self-confidence to his young companions. The other element is that when you are going to deal with a task, with duties and responsibility, you will of course develop your potential your experience, you will become more skillful and equipped. So it was a way for him to train Usama. And you know, we have sometimes in our communities, it's the case in my country in France, and I, I, I think that it's the same here, we have some uh, intergenerational problems when it comes to transmission, when it comes to power, to authority, and we have a problem in both sides. Sometimes the elders don't want to trust young people and to give them power and duties. And they want to keep these duties and powers for themselves. As well as some youngsters, young people, sometimes are thinking that they are knowing everything, and they don't need the elders. No, we need each other. And we have to be complementary. It's very important. And this story about Usama is giving us a teaching about this, because as the Prophet have, has chosen Usama to be the leader and to empower him as a young man, Abu Bakr Siddiq who came to Usama and he, he gave him some advices based upon his huge experience and Usama accepted it. He accepted the advices of a man who is older than him, who is uh, more wise than him and more skillful. He was not in a position to say, okay, the Prophet gave me the power, so I don't accept any advice. No. As a young man, he accepted the advice of his elder. And Abu Bakr Siddiq, as an elder, accepted the choice of the Prophet Muhammad to follow a young leader for the Muslim army. So it's a very important teaching for us when it comes to intergenerational issues and problems. Let me go into another example, but before it, you should understand something. The Prophet ﷺ had a very developed uh, psychological analysis. He knew the psychology of his people, of each one of his companions. And in order to reform them, to improve them, to teach them, it's very important to take into account this psychological side. You know, like one month ago, I had a very beautiful discussion with uh, Dr. Malek Badri from Sudan, who is one of the specialists in the matter, in the matter of uh, Islamic psychology. And in the frame of what some people are calling Islamization of knowledge. And he, he, he told me something very interesting. He told to me about two uh, Muslim leaders of India or Pakistan. And these two leaders were in conflict uh, between them. And at the end of the day, he told me in fact, one of the